Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, our text will be all 21 verses that make up this chapter. As we continue to trace this theme through this book of Genesis, that God is a, a good and gracious God, we come here perhaps to one of the clearest manifestations of that truth. Of course, God is the main actor throughout each of the four great cycles that make up this book of Genesis, the section of the beginnings which we saw in the first 11 chapters. Now we're here in this cycle of Abraham that began in chapter 12 and will extend to chapter 25. And then we'll see it again with uh, Isaac and Jacob in chapters 26 to 36. And in the final section starting in chapter 37 with Joseph and Judah. Over and again, this great theme that our God is presenting to us and presenting himself that he is good and gracious, um, that he is trustworthy, uh, and that goodness and grace actually meets us right when we fear, right where we doubt, right where we wonder whether God will keep his promises, whether God is in fact who he says he is. Again, I say we, we see this most clearly here in this chapter, in this great gospel chapter, Genesis 15, but in order to see it, we need not only our own human eyes and insight, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So let's ask him to help us, shall we? Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do come as your people this morning, asking that you would grant us your grace that we might see you in the pages of Holy Scripture. Indeed, Holy Spirit, we pray, come, open our eyes of faith that we might see glorious riches in this portion of your word. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis chapter 15 then, beginning in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age and they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these paces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Canaanite, the Kenites, and the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, 
the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So when my wife Sarah and I were heading off to seminary, Westminster Theological Seminary, uh, eight months married, it was August 1994, I was sent ahead a couple weeks before to do two things. I had two tasks to accomplish on that initial trip. The first was to find a job. And I did find a job at Westminster Seminary Bookstore earning five bucks an hour. What a job. The second thing I was to do was to find us a place to live. And after scouting around different apartment complexes, I came upon one in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, that was run by a company called Corman Suites. And I showed up in the rental office, and they showed me the model, the model apartment. And I tell you what, that apartment, it was amazing. The carpet, ugh. The carpet was plush. And, the, and the, the room itself and the rooms connected to the apartment, they were immaculate, uh, tastefully decorated. It was unbelievable. The amenities, they were amazing. I couldn't wait. After five minutes, though, I was twice as much as what we were paying in Indiana. And remember, I was only making five bucks an hour. I signed on the dotted line eager to move into our new apartment, excited that I accomplished my task. Two weeks later, we came with our moving van and our uh, car on the back and a, and a tow behind it. And I opened the door to lead my newly uh, married bride into our apartment that I had selected. And reality didn't match up to what was promised. The carpets, they were kind of threadbare. And there was actually a couple of stains in the corner and in the living room. Uh, and the walls and the, the room is, is itself, well, they didn't look like they had been cleaned after the previous occupants had moved out. And as far as the amenities, well, we never used them. We actually had a first floor end unit apartment with windows that you could open even when they were locked shut. Did I mention that Ben Salem's just on the edge of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? Yeah, it was a nervous time, all because reality didn't match up to what was promised. I wonder, though, I wonder if Abraham felt like at this point here in Genesis 15, as though reality wasn't match matching up much to what God had promised. After all, this story starts with God promising, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And that means two things, children and land. But reality is confronting Abraham right at the place of those promises. Here we are three chapters later, and Abraham has no children of his own. He thought that perhaps maybe God meant that Lot was to be his heir. But when Lot was offered a place in the promised land, Lot decided not to take Uncle Abraham up on the offer. He made his way out of the promised land. In terms of the land, he had no land of his own. He was a wandering Armenian. He was a nomad living in tents, shepherding sheep and livestock. And so when we come to chapter 15, verse 1, we don't fault Abraham for feeling as though his reality was not matching up to God's promises. And as he surveyed the scene, he had to wonder, well, God, how are you going to keep these promises? When? When are you going to keep these promises? God, will you? Will you keep your promises? And even behind those questions are the questions that have really been echoing throughout Genesis, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The questions that, that Adam and Eve wrestled with. God, are you really good? Are you really gracious? God, are you really just, will you really do what is right? And how will I know? How will I know? Of course, those questions, they're not just the questions of historical figures in the Bible. They're your questions. They're my questions. God, are you really good? 
when my adult child has, has left the faith and is wandering in a pathway that, that I cannot rescue them from? Are, are, are you really, in fact, good? God, are you gracious when this unexplained illness has happened to my husband, my wife, my child, my parent? And I don't know what's going on, but they're in the hospital and I can't see them right now because COVID? Are you really gracious? God, are you really just? Even though I've given my life to following after you and serving you in the context of the church, when people attack me, what, will you actually defend me? Are you just? Will you do what's right? When, when reality, when our reality doesn't match up to what we think God has promised, and we are confronted by this overwhelming flood tide of our circumstances, and when all around us is giving way, and, and we feel as though the winds are high and the gales are stormy, the question that rises within us is really, can we trust God? Can you trust him? Can I trust him? Not just can we trust his promises. Can you and I, can we trust God? And the answer of the Bible here in this place that we've just read together is yes. Yes, we can. Why? His oath, his covenant, and his blood support us in the whelming flood. That line from that old gospel song is driven, is, is taken from this place right here in Genesis chapter 15. Here are reasons why you and I can trust God when it seems as though our reality is not matching up to what he has promised. Of course, that's what Abraham's learning here. He's learning to trust the God who's made these covenant promises. It, this chapter opens with, with God coming to Abraham in a vision. That's what verse 1 tells you. It's the only time that God speaks to Abraham in just this way, by way of a, a vision. And in fact, verse 1 sounds very familiar to you if you've read much in the Old Testament prophets. If you look at verse 1 again, you'll see, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. The word of the Lord came to Abram. He needed to hear the word of the Lord. Guess what? You and I need to hear the word of the Lord. It's not by accident that after we read scripture Sunday by Sunday, what is it that the minister says? This is the word of the Lord. Each week as we come, we hear the word of the Lord for us. The reminder of these promises and ultimately the reminder of who God is for us. That's what Abraham needed to hear. He needed to hear the word of the Lord. And so the word of the Lord came to Abram. And what does God say? Well, the first thing that God says is not a reiteration of the promises. No, the very first thing God says is he wants to remind Abraham who he really is. Who God really is. For Abraham, you see it? After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, or Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Who is this God who made promises? First, God tells Abraham that he is his defender. He's his defender. He says that he is his shield. Now, we've just read in chapter 14 of this great military engagement that the kings of the east of Assyria and Babylon, among others, have, have gathered together and have attacked those kings of the Jordan Valley plain, among whom were the king of Sodom. And they actually defeat those kings. And so what does Abraham do? Well, we remember he cobbles together an alliance. He brings his own household of, of men and, and cobbles them together with others. And they go and they defeat these great kings from the east. Well, how do they do that? Well, they used spears and shields. They were the, the implements of military action, of war and valor. Having just come off that action, how many ever years previously God comes to Abraham and says, remember how you used your shield to defend you? 
That's nothing compared to who I am for you. I am your shield. And so don't fear. Don't fear the attacks of the enemy. Don't fear your current circumstances. I am your shield. I am your defender. I will protect you. I will look out for you. But that's not all God says. He says, he says, defender, not only I'm your shield, but your reward shall be very great. Or some of your Bible says your very great reward. The language here, again, is military language. It's, it's the prize money, the booty that might be taken as a result of, of a successful military action. You remember in, in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham didn't take any of the prize money. It was offered to him by the king of Sodom. You take the money, just give me the people. Abraham refused. He said, I'm not going to have the king of Sodom making me rich. I'm going to trust the Lord instead. And so God comes to him and says, Abraham, I'm your shield. I am your very great reward because I am your defender. You're not going to lose in this exchange. You've not made a fool's bargain in following after me. No, I will take care of you. I will look out for your interests. The world looks at us as followers of Jesus Christ and they say, you've made a fool's bargain. You're following after Jesus Christ. You're denying yourself, taking up your cross and following him. Meanwhile, you're missing all sorts of things that this world offers. You've said no to privilege and power and prestige. Meanwhile, we are enjoying the good things of this world and you're denying yourself. You're losing and you're a loser by following in this way. And God comes to us here and he says, no. No, you're not a loser in this exchange. Because God will make sure that your interests are looked after. He is your great reward. He is, in fact, your defender. That's who he is for you. In the same way he is for Abraham, so he is for you. This God who's made promises to you. He's your defender, your shield, your reward. But the other thing that God tells Abraham here is that he is Abraham's deliverer. You see it in, in verse 7. And he, God, said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Do you hear an echo there of a more familiar place? How does the Ten Commandments begin? In Exodus chapter 20, God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now look again at chapter 15, verse 7. I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. I don't think that similarity is unintentional. I think Moses is echoing here the more familiar place to God's people it's actually right here in Genesis 15. God is the one who is his people's deliverer. He's saying to Abraham, just as he will say to Israel in the Exodus, I am your redeemer. I am your deliverer. I am the one who graciously chose you. I am the one who called you to myself. I am the one who made gracious promises to you. You can trust me. You can trust me. You see, God's reminding Abraham, and this morning, God's reminding you that he is infinitely, eternally, and unchangeably good. He's infinitely good, and eternally good, and unchangeably good. The one who made precious promises to Abraham is the same one who's made precious promises to you out of his goodness and out of his grace. He... he He's not like some kind of used car salesman, trimming the waist, cute in the face, I care about you. No, that's not what God's like. God isn't simply there to care about you so that you can do something for him. His love is towards you all of the time. Because he's infinitely and unchangeably and uh, you know, eternally good. That's who he is for you. And because he is that kind of God, a God who is your defender, a God who is your deliverer, 
He comes again to remind Abraham and to remind you of his promises. It's, it's striking that when he tells Abraham again what he's promised, he does so in, in direct response to the very real questions that Abraham has. As Abraham looks at his reality and he says, it doesn't match up to what you've promised God. Did you see how Abraham does that? Look at verse 2. Then Abram fell on his face. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you. Uh, wrong page. Sorry. Um, page 2. Uh, chapter 15, verse 2. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Look again at verse 8. Abram asks a similar kind of question. O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it, that I shall possess the land? Abraham comes with his very real questions. And we can understand why he has these questions as he looks at his reality and it's not matching up to what God's promised. Remember, Abraham was minding his own business back in Genesis chapter 11 in Ur of the Chaldeans. He wasn't seeking after God. And yet God comes to him and says, Abraham, I've chosen you. I'm calling you and I'm giving you these promises. Leave your family, leave your country, leave all that you know. Go to the land that I will show you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a great name. Through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And yet the years are passing. And Abraham thought that maybe, maybe Lot was going to be the offspring, the heir. But no, it's not Lot. And God's brought him to the land, to Shechem, to the very center of the land. And God said, I'm going to give this land to your offspring. And, and Abraham believes him and he worships in response to him. And they worships again at Bethel Ai. But he goes down to Egypt because, you know, it's, we're getting kind of hungry here. There's a famine that's broken out. God brings him right back to where he was supposed to be. Lot has left him. Years have passed. We don't know how many years have passed between the action of chapter 14 and the action of chapter 15. But years certainly have passed. And, and the longer it goes, undoubtedly, the more that Abraham's wondering, did I make a mistake? And did, did, did I dream all of that? I mean, did God really say that? Is God really good and just? Will he in fact remember? Is God trustworthy? When is it all going to happen? And so he asks very real questions of God. Abraham does. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting when Abraham asks these questions... God doesn't upbraid him. And when you ask your very real questions of God, when your reality doesn't seem to be matching up with what God has promised, and you ask your very real questions of God, he won't upbraid you either. We sometimes think that God's some kind of harsh parent. So what are you doing here again with your questions? No, God's not like that. He doesn't treat Abraham that way at all. Rather, it's in response to his doubts and his fears that God comes graciously and he makes the promises again. But this time with more information. He promises children. Uh, in, in response to the idea that Eliezer of Damascus is going to be Abraham's heir, he says, no, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And in fact, he doubles down and he takes him outside and says, look at all those stars. Count them if you can. That's how many your offspring shall be. And in regards to the land, in, in response to that question, God gives more information in, beginning in verse 13. He says, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs, will be servants there. They will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. Afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Here's more information. Abraham, you yourself will not fully possess the land, but mark my words, you will. 
through your offspring, though there's going to be some time that's going to pass, you and your offspring will possess the land. God reiterates these covenant promises once again to Abraham, but notice he does so after he reminds Abraham who he is. It does very little good to have the promises from a God who's malevolent, from a God who's harsh, from a God who's impotent. God comes first to Abraham and he comes first to you and me. He says, I'm not that kind of God. I am a God who is good and gracious. I am your de defender and deliverer. I'm able to deliver on my promises. Trust me and remember the promises. And God could have stopped there just by giving the promises, but he doesn't stop there. He actually confirms the promises with an oath. Uh, the scene that begins in verse 9, it's strange to us, this ceremony. God tells Abraham to, to get these animals that would look familiar to God's people later in time because of the Levitical code. He says, bring me a heifer, verse 9, a female goat, a ram, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. All of those were offered as sacrifices as a result of the demands of Leviticus. God tells Abraham to cut uh, the, the heifer, the goat, and the ram in half and create a pathway between them to strangle the birds and to separate them. Abraham arranges all of this, protects it until nightfall, and then God causes a deep sleep to come upon him. A great and dreadful darkness falls upon him. And then, down the, down the aisle, do you see it in your imagination? There's this pot with smoke coming out of it, creating a kind of cloudy pillar out of the pot. And there's a torch a pillar of fire walking down the aisle between the carcasses. But look, look carefully. There's no one carrying those things. They're going of their own accord, going just as Israel, much, much later, had seen the pillar of fire by day and the pillar of cloud by night, leading them for 40 long years to the land promised so many years before to Abraham. Those same things are present walking down that aisle. What does it mean? Well, it means the Lord is the one walking, enacting this ancient ceremony in which when covenant was made, those making the covenant would walk between the carcasses. And in doing so, they would say to one another and to the gods, may the gods do to me just like these carcasses, may I be killed, may I be slaughtered, may I be split in half if I fail to keep my promise. But this isn't a human being walking between the carcasses. This is God. And it's as though this good and gracious God was saying to Abraham and to us, may I, the one who is infinite and eternal and unchangeable, may I die. Might I be killed, cut in half, slaughtered, if I fail to keep my promise to you, Abraham? In other words, God's saying here, Abraham, you can trust me to keep your, these promises. Cross my heart. Hope to die. It's a strong oath. It's a strong oath for God to, to make this kind of promise. We've heard it already in the assurance of pardon from Hebrews chapter 6. We can anchor our hope because God is the one making the promises. And God is saying, cross my heart, hope to die. But here's the wonder of it all. We're here in 2020, thousands of years, millennia beyond the promises made to Abraham so long ago. And friends, the reason why you and I are sitting here worshiping this God who's come to us in Jesus Christ is because, in fact, God, in fact, died to keep his promises. Because it's not just his covenant, his promise, his oath, but it's also his blood that serves to save us and to give us a rock in these stormy times. 
And the, and the reality is that God died to keep his promises when, when the eternal son of God took on human flesh and not only lived the perfect righteous life that we could never live, but he actually went to Golgotha's hill. Then he was raised between heaven and hell for you and for me. And he was cut in half as the spear was plunged into his side, rent asunder, nails piercing his hand and his feet. Why? Because he made a promise to rescue you. And why did he do that? Because he loves you. That's who God is. He's a God of infinite and eternal and unchangeable love. And on that day we call Good Friday... Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, said, cross my heart, here I die for you and for me. So that in those times when our reality doesn't seem to match up to what God has promised, we take our hearts to the cross and there we see not just what God has done, we see how much God has loved. And so what's our response to all of this? Well, Abraham models the response for us. It's in verse 6. And he believed the Lord. And he, God, counted it to him, Abraham, as righteousness. He believed the Lord. Not simply he believed the promises. No. Abraham trusted a person, namely God himself. He trusts this God who is good and this God who is just, this God who is trustworthy. But friends, that's the call to you this morning. As you're here this morning and you might feel as though your reality is not matching up to what God has promised but you've seen displayed before you his, his covenant, his oath, his blood. The call to you this morning is, will you trust God? Will you believe the Lord? Will you believe that he is good and he is gracious and he is just and he is your defender and he is your deliverer and he is for you and he's coming again for you. And he will keep all of his promises to you. They are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Will you trust him? Friends, that's, that's the only solid rock we have. It's, it's, it's Christ. This good and gracious God who went to the cross for you. Trust in him. Because all other ground, all other ground, it's sinking sand. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I do pray that you would help me to live into my own sermon, even as together we desire to, to hear the word of the Lord and to obey it. Lord, we desire to trust you, to believe you. Lord, please grant us grace to cling to your oath, your covenant, your blood. But grant us grace to cling to you, knowing that you cling to us. You are the faithful God who will never let go of us. Lord, grant us grace to trust you and to trust you yet more. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.